Uh, I'm sort of taking us into the 17th century. I hope that's okay. I realize we've been definitely kind of slowly drawing our way here eventually throughout the day. Um, and I probably should say just to begin that this is very much a work in progress project. Uh, it's part of a larger postdoctoral project on political pots and thinking about ceramics and reading them as historical texts, working from 1600 to about 1850 or so. Um, so I'm really uh, delighted to be in such uh, a knowledgeable audience and looking forward to your feedback. Undoubtedly, the 17th century in England bore witness to a changing world with a rise in print culture, increasing literacy rates, and as people like Joan Thirsk and Sarah Pennell and others have discussed, a growing domestic consumer market amongst the middling classes and people of the lower gentry. This is all, of course, set very much against a changing political landscape, uh, the violent upheaval caused by the civil wars to the execution of Charles I in 1649 and the subsequent restoration of the monarchy in 1660. And of course, unnaturally, such events had a significant impact on material and visual culture, and especially on the novel new industry of Delftware ceramics production in London. And that's really the subject of my discussion today. From pro-monarchist and treasonous dishes showing Charles I and his meal heirs, men in Southwark in the early 1650s, to demonstrate the longevity of dynastic power, to cups mass produced and consumed following the restoration of Charles II, declaring political allegiance and loyalty. Kind of ceramics play this very key role in this wider dissemination of monarchical power structures at this time. Often based on prince culture, these objects raise questions regarding the intermedial nature of ceramics production, representations of history, and the performative nature of the political experience during this time. And such interchange between media, as someone like Mark Hallett has rightly stated, might be said to be one of the most defining characteristics of the 17th century across British art, architecture, and design. But ceramics have really been marginalized within this conversation up until this point. Uh, so this is sort of a bringing them to the forefront of the historical uh, conversation, the historical landscape. So instead, this paper is very much arguing that ceramics embody a particular currency as historical agents, producing meaning and constructing narratives of monarchical political rhetoric. Imbued with agency, it asks what type of role these ceramics played within the visual, material and haptic uh, quotidian political experience. And quite often these objects were displayed um, proudly or perhaps as we'll see covertly in, a, in interiors. Yet as objects of use and haptic engagement, they also played crucial roles in the performative nature of loyalist toasts in households and taverns, perhaps amongst friends or amongst larger gatherings. So this paper really unpacks how potters and consumer markets responded to unpredictable moments of socio-political change through such material culture. It argues for ceramics to be understood as historical agents shaping socio-political conversations, burgeoning constructions of history and loyalist ideologies, leaving a lasting historical and material legacy in the political consciousness of mid 17th century England. And I just couldn't resist putting up this particular image. This is one of our displays at the v &A on in the British galleries. And obviously uh, the mug in the center of uh, Charles and Diana was not created in the mid 17th century um, as sort of a curatorial uh, play for the visitor, the eagle, eager eyed visitor, I suppose. Um, but I think it does say something about this tradition of commemorative objects still happening today, kind of becoming very ubiquitous and something we assume, but actually I'm really trying to interrogate how did this start and why and what did it actually mean at that point as well. So this kind of commemoration on pots very much uh, survives. Most of the wares that I'm going to be showing are earthenware, so the type known as Delftware, uh, which is essentially decoration painted onto a white tin glaze. And Delftware was really the first ceramic material, I would argue, that was used for propaganda purposes, um, as well as commemorative purposes, documenting both public opinions and private loyalties. And the majority of the ones I'm looking at today were most likely produced in London. A couple um, produced in Bristol, but London is really the main production for these objects at this point. And in London, local clay was mixed uh, with a clay which had a higher calcium carbonate content and that was coming, being brought in from East Angula and also from Carrickfergus. 
And the clay was essentially dissolved into sort of water-filled tanks. And you can see these here um, on the screen. And it became this kind of soupy mixture, uh, not very appealing uh, for a Saturday afternoon. But then it was essentially strained into a shallow drying tank. Um, so that would actually make the water evaporate. The clay was then trodden on, and that would completely remove air bubbles. And then it would have been thrown onto a wheel, although sometimes molds were used. And essentially, we have a kind of unglazed biscuit vessel that was ready for decoration. It was first dipped into a tin white glaze, um, which was a sort of a mixture of tin oxide and lead oxide, and it was decorated. And after this, it was then fired. Um, the London Delftware industry then was really still very much in its infancy in the 1640s when war broke out between King and Parliament. And of course, as we know, 1649, Charles I is executed and rule without king is established in England. As a sort of um, shift with this, royalist supporters were obliged very much to surrender their silver tablewares under threat of penalties and inspections that were being carried out. And quite a lot of key players at this point, and especially city livery companies, were forced to dispose of their treasures. And quite a lot of these were then replaced with wood, but mostly with delftware. So it's probable that something like this, which is a very, very early um, Delphur candlestick based directly on a silver example made in 1648, um, which was owned by the Fishmongers Company, uh, would have been, you know, would have suffered the similar kind of fate having been to be sold. Um, they'd had to sell their silver, so they're buying something else um, and adding their own arms to it at this point. So the success of the Delftware industry at this point um, really coincides with an overall growth in pottery use for various reasons, uh, and that sort of shifts towards these commemorative wares that we begin to see. As Delftware could be produced on a fairly large scale, it was also easily painted, um, and frequently painted, kind of the painting that goes through it is um, likened to watercolour because you had to do it so, so quickly um, before it dried. So, that, you know, quite a uh, kind of um, ordered uh, labor process going on. So it was really the perfect material for showcasing private and public loyalties. This charger, which is dated 1653, is a really fascinating example of this kind of early commemorative wear. And it shows a full length, striking, I think, full length portrait of Charles I and his three male heirs. So Prince Charles, Prince James, and Henry, Duke of Gloucester. And for supporters of the British monarchy, the preservation and longevity of the dynasty was incredibly important. So this was made four years after his execution. And of course, the very year uh, that Cromwell was made Lord Protector. So it very much as a piece demonstrates continuing uh, sympathy during the Commonwealth period for the monarchy. And if you can just eager eyes of you spot the initials at the very top, um, which has the date 1653, and then above it, it has an A-T. E, uh, and the, those initials were probably of a newly married couple with royalist sympathies who are actually commissioning this piece to be made to kind of mark uh, their coming together. And I think it's difficult in many ways not to think that owning such a dish in London in 1653 would not have been seen or potentially seen as a treasonous act, possibly punishable um, with severe penalties. And I think that really confirms the loyalty of whomever is commissioning these pieces, but it also brings up very interesting questions about the methods of production, of design, or how specific pieces like this were actually commissioned and then secretly produced and kind of how that was, ha the kind of a process passing between Delphware um, maker to buyer essentially. And of course, one of the key events in the history of English Civil War was the story of Charles II as a prince in 1651, hiding in the oak tree. tree. And in the British galleries at the v &A, there exists this remarkable tin glaze earthenware plaque dating from 1660 um, or thereabouts, depicting Charles II surrounded by the crowns of England, Scotland, and Ireland in the very branches of the Boscobel oak tree. And um, probably, again, this is made in London, and it's very much based on, oh, based on an engraving uh, by Peter Stent, and it's commemorating Charles in kind of one of the most key historical and political moments of the 17th century. 
And as we all know, Charles's escape from the parliamentary troops following the Battle of Worcester in 1651 was a story that he liked very much frequently to recount over the years, um, from the writings of Samuel Pepys to paintings and prints of the day, reinforcing a political, textual, and visual agenda whereby Charles II could become the people's king. At three o'clock in the morning of 4th September 1651, of course, a party of 60 royalist soldiers rode quietly up the gates of an old converted priory, the White Ladies, um, right on the border of Shropshire, uh, an area run by a farming family called the Pendrels. It was dark. Um, we know that they kind of passed and noticed through uh, miles and miles of countryside. And among them, of course, was, I think, 2021 20, at this point, Charles I, um, and at the White Ladies, his coat and his breeches apparently were removed. He was dressed in country clothes uh, and kind of um, an old hat and kind of uh, had his, apparently had his long royal locks cut short. And the King's account um, depicted sort of 30 years later to Samuel Pepys records the decision. And he says, um, Pepys writes, he told me that it would be very dangerous either to stay in the house or go into the wood, there being a great wood hard by Boscobel, and he knew but one way how to pass all the next day, and that was to get up into a great oak in a pretty plain place where we could see round about us, for they would certainly search all the wood for people that had made their escape. We got up into the great oak that had been locked some three or four years before, and so was grown out very bushy and thick, not to be seen through, and there we sat all the day. And the next day, the Pendrel brothers escort the king secretly away. And we know, of course, that um, Charles II loved to tell this story. And he commissioned a set of paintings to show the key moments of this adventure when he returns. Um, I'm showing you one of these here in the 1660s. And interestingly enough, with all of these paintings, Charles is not shown at the age in which he would have been when the events are taking place. Um, but he's shown at the age he is when he commissions them. It was quite an interesting visual trope happening here. So this is the third of a set of five scenes that he has created for this kind of dramatic escape um, following his defeat. As Scottish art historian um, Katrina Murray has noted, the Stuarts persistently promoted dynastic and domestic images to reinforce royal authority. And I think something that's quite interesting, I'm very interested in is, you know, with the materiality of ceramics, was that a particular means through which to disseminate the, this and this kind of particular form of image making to the public on a much larger scale. So what can we actually see in the tin glazed earthenware plaque? Well, we've got the head of Charles II surrounded by these crowns, um, and we've sort of flanked by two smaller trees and uh, bearing the scroll with the words of the royal oak, um, painted in different colors of manganese, and um, purple, yellow, and green, and this sort of um, running scroll around the border. And, I guess adding another literal and figurative layer to the ceramic object is the fact that it's set into a wooden frame, um, supposedly made from the, uh, of the bark of an oak tree, which legend, legend has it, came directly from the royal oak tree itself. As someone like Susan Stewart would see it, such materiality produces its meaning as a souvenir. Yet I would suggest that we can also read these types of objects as democratizing um, perhaps this experience and our interaction with political culture and historical records with such an object. The act of inserting this pack into the bark suggests that it was worth preserving. And we know that there was um, quite a well accounted for tradition of taking wood from the tree as a souvenir, um, a sort of tourist carving out pieces, an act of claiming their stake in this metaphorical symbol of royal British history. And the cultural significance of such a piece demands further scrutiny. As an, and actually what's been quite interesting in researching for this talk, I've just discovered another one of these in a private collection, but because it's been recorded, I wasn't able to show you an image. Um, that's very, very excited by that. Um, and I should say with this particular example, because of the provenance of the piece, uh, again, which I sadly can't disclose, um, it does, there are, you know, the shifts coming that, that, that it was inserted into the plaque in the 1660s. Whether it was that exact bark, will we ever know? It was a bark from a tree nearby on the land, which geographically from where this piece comes from would suggest that it might be. Um, so it's quite, yeah, sort of watch the space, I suppose. 
So to what extent does such a commemorative piece reinforce royal power and authority? Well, I think in many ways, it certainly helps make someone like Charles II a people's king. And it certainly helped record one of the best known stories of history from this period. And again, this idea of setting the plaque into the original tree of where this event supposedly takes place is this kind of um, showing this object as a literal, tangible example of history. And I find that quite interesting. And once again, just like in the portraits and in the paintings, Charles is depicted in the ceramic as a sort of much older man. Again, it's quite interesting here. Of course, 1660 saw the restoration of Charles II. Um, Cromwell had died a couple of years before that, and there was this desire to bring back, or presumably a desire to, we think, to desire to bring back more stability and order, but not always necessarily the case with this decision. But it very much, his restoration was seen as a momentous occasion. Lots of ballads, popular royalist songs, um, which sort of greeted and commemorated this event. Notably, Thomas Blout wrote and published several key histories from the Civil War, including Boscobel, The History of His Sacred Majesties, um, which was published in 1660. And we know of, uh, that Edward Hyde, first Earl of Clarendon, um, wrote The History of the Rebellion, uh, which was written in the 1640s, but actually wasn't published until much later. But despite this, of course, it's important to remember that according to people, and particularly David Cressy, who's in a lot of work, done a lot of work on this, that in the 17th century, only about 30% of men um, and probably about 10% of women were literate. So still quite you know, really relatively low numbers. The visual culture, material culture and oral news um, and things like ballads were incredibly important in terms of disseminating information to the masses. The increase in visual and material culture which commemorated Charles's restoration then was incredibly important to as it suggested an increasing demand for objects that could show political allegiance for the king. And it was really the Delftware factories that came to the front and sort of supplied this rising consumer market. Um, but of course, we have to remember that these were uh, highly decorative, brightly colored goods um, that could have been hung on the wall to decorate your home or put onto cabinets. Um, but quite a few of them are colorful little mugs like this one painted with rather schematic portraits of Charles II. And I think these are really um, among the earliest commemorative British wares. And they were really meant um, as much for display, I think, as for use. So here we see a bust of, um, go back on. Here we see a bust uh, portrait of Charles II under um, a sort of triumphal arch in sort of dull, uh, you know, blues, ochre, yellow, um, inscribed CRX. Uh, with a sort of white uh, interior in the background. And vessels like this are um, normally called caudal cups, which refers to a medicinal drink known from medieval times onwards. And undoubtedly, ceramics um, cups like these become very popular mediums for royal portraits. Uh, so you have cups and bottles, and they were used widely, not only in the domestic home, but also in taverns. And as such, their visual decoration really has the potential to reinforce the position of the crown by declaring the user's loyalty. And I think the key thing with something like this is that they would have been used. A person's haptic engagement with the object as they held it in their hands or poured from it or drank with it, or perhaps even toasted with it, meant that these objects took part in a, in a sort of form of social performance. Users or owners had the opportunity to hold a piece of history in their hands. And perhaps such images even started conversations or rather debates or arguments amongst um, friends. And it's likely that such objects played a key roles in establishing networks of gift exchange as well through material culture. So what was the level of production of um, these types of wares like? Well, such mugs we know um, normally were never included in inventories of Delft factories um, or London pottery. So there's a slight kind of issue in terms of getting data of how many were created and produced, but they must have formed a minute proportion of their, a significant proportion of their output. Uh, they would have been cheap to buy, um, yet their decoration would have ensured that they were probably seldom used. So a huge number have really survived intact in greater numbers than we would expect. And I think that um, for their material and um, survival says a lot. It's also important to note with this one and, and, and one like this, um, that such images were, they were very kind of dashed off very quickly and it would have been quite a formulaic process of production. 
as these images were repeated and repeated and repeated, um, often with kind of varying detail, um, as you might see. Of course, here we have a composition very similar to the dish I showed earlier, but uh, this time um, in the same sort of architectural space, but this time we've got Charles II uh, on this one here, um, holding his scepter and globe, standing between columns under an arch on a checkered floor, um, and they've got these lovely kind of tops with the can acanthus leaves. And that happens quite a lot. You get these delftware portraits of Charles II, often in ceremonial robes, probably derived from published images like this one I'm showing you. And this is a particular line engraving by William Fairthorne from the early 1660s. And uh, it's now at the National Portrait Gallery, and it shares sort of several similarities, especially in terms of the design of the crown, but the shape of the scepter, and as well as the uh, gold medallions um, around the neck as well. But what we have, I think, with the Delft piece, of course, it seems obvious to say, but it's worth saying, is the introduction of colour. And I think that does really transform the design. It brings kind of vibrancy um, to the story and to the um, kind of historical moment as well. And similarly, iconography from this printed um, etching, which is now at the British Museum, was translate, kind of translated into a lot of Delftware pieces. Um, we've got an image of Charles uh, kind of being led to Parliament. Um, wearing his crown and his or holding his orb and scepter, um, riding through a procession in London. And you, if you just look out closely enough, you can see um, they've got the sort of sign of the Royal Oak for the kind of tavern that uh, he's passing by. I always, always love that detail. And several prints exist, of course, which um, record Charles's coronation when he's possessing through the city of London. But it's more likely this one is actually him riding to a kind of a state opening of parliament. He's already been crowned at this point. He's already wearing everything. But several of these sort of key motifs and prints like this end up on existing ceramic pieces during the time. Uh, so I'm just gonna show you very lastly, um, the last couple of minutes, just a couple of these. Uh, so we've got some jugs, um, would have predominantly been used for ale, but also perhaps for water. Um, so we've got to the back of the jugs are two sort of panels, um, enclosing a ship with trees on one side um, and a sort of twisted rope. Um, and in the other, we've got a sort of central reserve of a sort of full torso portrait of Charles II, um, holding a scepter in his right hand and an orb in his left. Um, and just a kind of blow up close, uh, so you can see that a bit closer. And of course, the regalia, regalia made for Charles II's coronation in 1661 um, forms a central part of the crown jewels today, but uh, they had been completely destroyed uh, during the Commonwealth. And so the king actually had to commission new pieces to be made um, when he returns, um, done by the royal goldsmith, uh, Robert Viner. Uh, so you can see the scepter, which he's holding in this, on the image of this jug, representing, of course, the sovereign's kind of spiritual rule. Um, and you also have the um, sovereign's orb, a sort of symbol of godly power on earth uh, with a cross above it. So once again, it becomes clear that the desire to mark and celebrate the historic moment of the restoration of the monarch infiltrated into the market of Delft wares and encouraged a large market of commemorative pieces. But here with this royal um, kind of... Uh, of his royal pieces together, the image very much confirms Charles's right to rule, his right to the throne. Um, but we also have, and hopefully you can see just to the right hand side, um, again, some initials for SB, uh, which is most likely referencing, again, whoever commissioned this particular piece, the own original owner of this piece, determined to show their loyalty to the king. And through such objects, furthermore, we're kind of emphasizing the monarchial image making of this time through the ceramic material medium. So in conclusion, during this period, as we have seen, um, there was a proliferation of decorative and useful ceramic wares that were made by several factories, um, most of which were in London, uh, producing scaled down images based on well-publicized historical moments, produced very much quickly in years following the key historical events which they depicted. They were also seeking to commemorate key moments in British history whilst also allowing the user to demonstrate their political and often monarchical allegiance. Often, these ceramics used um, uh, gave the opportunity to the users holding the mugs or the jugs to actually kind of look at them up close and in their hands and bring these scaled down images closer to their eyes. So they invited a very different kind of political engagement 
and representation in comparison to textual forms of print in a historical moment when many were still not literate. Um, and they also acted as decorative colorful items in displays or brightening up domestic interiors and um, taverns, etc. And through songs, toasts, or ballads, or ballads, um, many may have acted as key agents in a performative ritual of political sovereignty. Ceramics then as visual and material objects had the potential to play a key role in the broader understanding of dynastic power during the 17th century in Britain and how this uh, was essentially disseminated through a broader range of social classes. And I think we only need to look at a handful of these pieces from this era to see uh, the role that ceramic squares were playing in recording, making and commemorating history during this time. And today I think they allow us to imagine the past um, even just a bit more vividly. Thank you. <laughs>